Now, I'm going to apologize for my peculiar accent um, to start with. And I'm actually not truly an Australian. I grew up in Alberta. <laughs> Don't hold it against me. I, I left as soon as I could. Um, but I've lived in Australia the last 28 years, so I've got a bit of a morphed accent. So I'll try to speak as Canadian as I can. And my discussion topic today is going to be the gastrointestinal microbiome and its importance to health. Um, there's going to be some relevance to autism specifically, but it's really trying to take the big picture here as well. And I was lucky enough to have this as, or choose this as a PhD topic, uh, or a research topic in 2000. Which, so I've spent 20 years researching gut microbiome, well and truly before it was cool um, and, and the hot topic. So it's been really, it was a, a ple I'm glad that I chose such a topic, but I had no idea at the time it was going to bloom in the way that it actually did. So the gut microbiota, back when I started, we call it the microflora or the gut ecosystem. Um, and we've probably heard some of the stats of this before, but it's 10 to the 14 living organisms, which is 100 trillion microbes, a lot. And this may be 10 times the number of cells that there is in the human body. And the reason why I say may is because we were all pretty fixed on this idea, but scientists being scientists a few years ago said, no, let's have a discussion and debate around it. So now it might be one third micro, or human cells versus two thirds microbes. So we're, we're still working out the final details, but you are still more microbe than you are non microbe. A thousand different species have been isolated from the human gut so far. And in general, we live in a mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship. If, if we're getting seven hours of sleep per night, if we're handling our stress really well, if we're um, exercising moderately, consistently, if we're eating a predominantly plant based rainbow type diet filled with, with fiber if we're avoiding processed foods and food additives and food chemicals, if we're avoiding antibiotics, if we're avoiding proton pump inhibitors, if we're avoiding non sterile anti-inflammatory drugs, how many people can actually put up their hand and saying they're doing all those things? There's a few, but not many. And our, our system can, can, can tolerate some of those things, but you start combining those together, we get a state of dysbiosis where that ecosystem, instead of being beneficial for us, is actually contributing to harm. Now, when I started out teaching this area, I was like, this is such an important organ, but very few people are talking about it. It's very much underappreciated. And I should really change this slide to becoming appreciated because I think most people in this room have at least heard of microbiome and at least some degree of its importance to health. But you go back 20, 15, 20 years, very few people were talking about it outside some core researchers who said, this is important. We need to pay attention to it. If we were able to scoop at all those microbes and put them onto a a scale, it'd be about one to two kilograms in weight, which is similar in size and, and weight to your liver, which is your most metabolically active organ. And we now know that it actually exceeds the liver in terms of the types of, and functionality <laughs> and the different tasks that it actually does for you. And there's a researcher back in the early 2000s um, from Sweden, Dr. Stig Begmark, who put forth this idea of the microbes we should be looking at as, as the microbiote organ. It plays critical functions in, our, in our, our body, and we need to start paying attention to, to its importance. Now, some people have taken a step beyond the microbiota organ to now describing humans as hollow biomes. And I think in 10 years' time, we're, all medical scientists are going to be talking about humans as beings that are composed of microbial cells and non-microbial cells, rather than there's bacteria growing here and I'm human. It's like, no, what makes you human is a combination of those microbes and non-microbe cells. So I think we're morphing towards that. Some definitions. Microbiota is a term I'm going to be using lots, which I think is, is less well known than the more catchy microbiome. But the microbiota are the microbes that are present in an environmental habitat. So there's going to be a microbiota in your toilet, in your sink. But we're going to be talking about the colon ecosystem predominantly. Microbiome is the microbes and their functions and their genes. So it's a much bigger picture. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is I'll be using the term microbiota. This biosis disturbance or imbalance in the biological system in, in changes in types and numbers that are actually causing harm. And the two terms on this page you might be more familiar with, that's probiotics, which are live microbes that when administered in adequate amounts confer health benefits, and then prebiotics. And we're going to cover these definitions in much greater depth later on this, this afternoon. 
but it's a substrate that is selectively utilized by beneficial bacteria and induces health changes. And that selectivity I've underlined for a reason because it's important. And one of the things that's often overlooked when people are discussing the concept of, of prebiotics. So there's the human gut. And with that gut microbiota, it actually differs a lot as we traverse through the gut. So the stomach, that bit there, we actually don't have many bacteria there. So we have maybe 10 to 1,000 bacteria per, per milliliter of, of stomach contents. Not many bugs. And those that are there are generally ones that we've swallowed. So the ones that are in our mouth, we swallow about a liter of saliva per day, which sounds like a lot if you put that out. And, and each milliliter of saliva has about 10 to the 8 bacteria. So we're swallowing about 100, no, 10 billion microbes per day from our saliva. And they go into our stomach. And, and thankfully, because of stomach acid, most of them are killed in that time point. Hence why we have small numbers there. We move into the small intestine. And further down the small intestine, the numbers of bacteria increase. And that's the diversity of the ecosystem increases as well. Because we're getting the same those microbes from our saliva, but we're getting some colon bacteria that have sort of migrated more upwards. But we see the colon, the number of microbes, substantially greater than anywhere else in the gut. The diversity of microbes, substantially greater. And it's this, when we're talking about the gut microbiome, gut microbiota, researchers are generally referring to the colonic ecosystem because it's seen as the most important. And that's got a couple of factors. One is the, the sheer number of microbes that are present far outweigh anywhere else in the gut. Two is the length of time those microbes have to communicate with gut cells and immune cells. Food is in your stomach maybe 30 minutes. Food is in, it essentially exits your small bowel generally around 90 minutes. It can sit in your colon, depending on your transit time, from 12 hours through to three weeks for some people. That's a lot of Three weeks isn't good, but it's a lot of chance for, for communication to occur, for bacterial metabolites to be absorbed and interact with us. So what does our microbiota organs do for us? Why is this so important? I'm going to cover these, in, I think, a bit of an overview because I think it is hugely important for human health. We know it modulates the immune system. There is interesting research done, 1950s and 60s animal models where they, they give them megadoses of antibiotics and they put them into a little sterile house. So essentially eradicated their gut flora, made sure it couldn't grow back. What impact did it have? Well, it turns out that their important immune organs like the thymus, thymus gland and the spleen shrank. The ability of white blood cells to deal with invaders decreased by about 90%. Huge. They introduced essentially poo from rats back into it mice, and all of a sudden, the thymus gland grew again, spleen grew, and the white blood cells started functioning normally again. We also know it plays a very important role for training your immune system to, to react to food proteins and, and allergens and things properly. It's not normal to react to, to, to peanuts and kiwi fruit and fish and anaphylactic type reaction that we're seeing more and more commonly these days. And that's because of that dysfunctional training that occurred in that early window where we had the wrong species present, which meant that the immune system did not get trained the way it's supposed to have. What we call normal gut motility also depended on the microbiome, that if we actually change the composition of the ecosystem or even eradicate the microbes, gut motility almost stops. It goes extremely slowly. So we know the presence of microbes in the composition can alter how quick or slow gut transit time is. Improves nutritional status. We know for a fair while that, that microbes have the capacity to produce B vitamins, but what we now know is they can produce vitamins B1, B2, B3, B5, B6, and folate in significant amounts in activated forms. And our colon cells, our large intestine, actually has pathways to utilize those vitamins. So we've evolved that, that capacity and that reliance on those microbes, but it depends on the composition whether we're producing those vitamins or not. Vitamin K, and even mineral absorption, much of your, your absorption of calcium and magnesium occurs in your colon. And how well you absorb that depends on the composition of that ecosystem. So we had that lovely talk about magnesium bit before and going, okay, well, if your ecosystem is disturbed or dysbiotic, you're not going to be absorbing the, the magnesium as well as someone that has a more balanced, healthy ecosystem. You're not going to be producing the activated B vitamins that your system needs when your ecosystem is dysbiotic. 
And recent research over the last 15 years has shown that things like blood sugar control, insulin sensitivity, very much tied into the microbiota composition. We now know that it can modulate brain neurotransmitters. When we actually eradicate the gut microbiota, brain function changes. That can happen directly. Some microbes actually produce things like serotonin, which is that sort of happy chemical. Some produce precursors and some either drive inflammation or decrease inflammation. And we'll talk about that in boards shortly. <laughs> xenobiotic metabolism. Are many of you familiar with the term xenobiotic? No, it's a very fancy term for foreign compounds. So there, there are good xenobiotics and, and bad xenobiotics to make it very simple. Pharmaceuticals. Research of the last couple of years, and this is a, a, a booming area, is looking at how the microbes actually interact with pharmaceuticals. And this may explain why some people are more sensitive to medications than others. And some microbes are actually able to break down the pharmaceutical before it actually gets get the chance to do its thing in certain people. For me, I use lots of herbal medicines in my practice. And a lot of herbal medicine constituents are entirely dependent upon microbiotic conversion for them to work. Things like saponins, polyphenols, polysaccharides, core components of a herb like ginseng. Most people here would have heard of ginseng before, correct? Well, if you don't have the right composition of, of microbes in your gut, ginseng is not going to do anything for you. It's really reliant upon that conversion. They eat those compounds, they convert them into smaller compounds which we do absorb that are biologically active to have effects. But when they eat it, they also grow. So when we're taking these herbal medicines, particularly ones that are traditionally been seen as, as nutritive and, and strengthening building like ginseng and codnopsis and astragalus, for example, we know we're actually nurturing those beneficial gut species and they're nurturing us in return by releasing those, comp making those compounds bioavailable and absorbable for us. But also dietary polyphenols. When we're eating cherries, berries, red grapes, acai, things like that, 90% of those dietary polyphenols are not absorbed. They reach the colon, they interact with the microbiota who convert them through to absorbable compounds. Again, it depends on whether they're there or not, whether they actually make those, those right, right conversions. The colonization resistance, you know, we're exposed to microbes all the time. You know, most things we eat or drink will have certain, degree, certain numbers of microbes on them, some of which are potentially pathogenic or disease causing. We know that we have an intact, diverse, healthy ecosystem. It's much harder for those pathogens to take hold, much harder for them to, to, to essentially take over some territory. Well, you take a course of antibiotics beforehand, you expose you to pathogens, you can take 10 times less pathogens and have them take hold because there's no competition. There's space, there's food. And they also produce compounds like short chain fatty acids, things like butyric acid or butyrate that was talked about by Dr. Fry this morning. Specifically, that, that our, our key thing, key compounds for our gut health and for our gut cell health, like, like colon cells, you know, our large intestine has evolved complete reliance with 70% of its energy needs are met from bacterial byproducts. If you don't have those products being produced, your gut doesn't function the way that it should. And that depends on what we feed the ecosystem and how much damage we cause to that ecosystem. We now know that weight management and metabolism are very much related to, to the microbiome, and I think importantly, the microbiota, depending on its composition, is either contributing to or causing inflammation or it's decreasing inflammation. That's not just in your gut, that's everywhere in your system. And that to me should be a huge takeaway because we can modulate that ecosystem so that it has an anti-inflammatory effect on your entire system, not just affecting the gut. Or if the balance is wrong, we're actually causing inflammation throughout your system based on what's there. So I think we really can say, for a very quick overview, that, we can, that you can see that connection between the gut microbes that are here and all these other body systems that help you function properly and at the top of your game. But is this organ functioning incorrectly in many Westerners? You eat that sort of food, it certainly will. And that's where we move into to dysbiosis, where there's an imbalance. And this is a definition that, that myself and a colleague put out in 2004. And in qualitative and quantitative changes in the flora, it's, it's metabolic activity or the local distribution that produces harmful effects on the host. 
Now, what diseases do we associate with dysbiosis now? And when I started off in this area, it was a relatively small list, and it was generally gut-related. You know, yeah, we had things like antibiotic-associated diarrhea. That makes sense. You take antibiotics, it changes the floor, you get diarrhea, for sure. But people didn't think, and some people still don't, and some clinicians still don't, that alcohol-related liver disease is actually caused by alterations in the microbiota. It's bacterial byproducts that are causing the damage to the liver. The alcohol causes negative changes to the ecosystem. The alcohol causes damage to your gut, so it becomes leaky, so you absorb more of those sort of toxic bacterial products, but it's still the bacteria that's the main driver of that. But what I found extremely fascinating is this ever-growing list of non-gut conditions that are now being associated with, with quite good research in many cases with gut dysbiosis. And we'll obviously things like, like you know, autism spectrum disorders on that list, but even things like anxiety, depression, that you would not have necessarily seen associated with gut bacteria five, 10, 15 years ago, to things like um, you know, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease. Again, you would not have necessarily associated them as a gut-related condition years ago. Now, there's two types of gut dysbiosis. Essentially, there's, there's what we call SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and there's clonic dysbiosis. And we're really going to be focusing a lot on clonic dysbiosis, and that's really where most of the research is at, has been focusing on, although there certainly are conditions associated with SIBO. But the overall importance of the clonic ecosystem is going to be the main focus and disruptions to that ecosystem. So I'm just going to run through some of those, those diseases that we highlighted before and look at some of the patterns that have been observed. So irritable bowel syndrome is, is quite common. We know that 15 to 20 percent of the people in this room would have IBS. So it is very common. Studies going back going, okay, well, people with IBS have different gas dynamics and people without IBS, they produce more, more hydrogen gas. For example, in healthy controls, they produce different short-chain fatty acids, like a different ratio of butyrate to propionate, et cetera. And the ecosystem itself seemed to differ. The earlier research found that they had lower levels of bacteria that you probably are familiar with, bifidobacteria, lactobacilli, and then higher concentrations of a more pro-inflammatory group of bacteria called enterobacteraceae. Also, colitis, less common condition, but it is common in Western nations versus non-Western nations where it is immensely rare. And its, it's instance has increased you know, tenfold in the last 20 years. So what do we see there? They have a, a less diverse ecosystem compared to healthy controls, lower levels of clonic lactobacilli, which we generally see as a beneficial bacteria, higher levels of sort of gut damaging um, and heroinherent E. coli, and low levels of two bacteria that you may not be so familiar with yet, but two species that I hope you grow to love over the course of the day, Fecalobacterium prosnitzii and Roseburia. And those are key butyrate producing bacteria. And people with ulcer colitis have less, less than them. And research found that people, even within that group of ulcer colitis who have more of those butyrate producing bacteria respond better to treatment, whether that is dietary treatment or conventional medicine treatment. They have more of the sulfate reducing bacteria that produces hydrogen sulfide gas, which is a sort of a, a toxic byproduct when producing a large amount that prevent colon cells from functioning properly. And there's also been some pretty exciting research about giving fecal microbial transplants or FMTs to treat ulcer colitis, where they're essentially taking poo from healthy people, giving it to people with ulcer colitis, and their ulcer colitis goes away or gets substantially better. Atopic eczema or atopic dermatitis. It's an interesting study where they looked at, at they looked at a group of kids, they looked at their ecosystem, and they, and they followed them up to see which ones developed eczema, which ones did not. Those that developed eczema essentially had a dysbiotic ecosystem that had low levels of bacteria, like bifidobacteria, that are sort of anti-inflammatory gut healing, and higher levels of species that are more gut damaging or have the potential to be so, like Bacteroides E. coli and Clostridia. Plus, we've had numerous studies showing that if you give the right prebiotic, the right probiotic, we can actually prevent eczema from developing in the next generation, which is pretty, pretty amazing, and also treat it in people that have it now. So again, alteration of the ecosystem actually changes you know, physical manifestations of allergic disease later in life. Alzheimer's disease. 
and this is going to be the new new frontier, I believe. And I think there was a I was reading the newspaper, which is not a great source of information for such things. But th there's a, a, a Chinese medication that that just received approval that was based on a seaweed extract, and it's, it's essentially designed as a prebiotic to to encourage the growth of beneficial bacteria. Use it to treat people with Alzheimer's, and their cognition improved dramatically. You think, ah, okay. So, you know, early stages yet, but it's amazingly exciting. And it's interesting seeing these links now between certain bacterial populations that actually have the capacity to cause damage to, to both the gut, but also to the blood brain barrier and cause neuroinflammation. And I think this is specifically related to, to Alzheimer's in this slide, but I think it's much more broad than that too. Some of the drivers here, like LPS or lipopolysaccharide, the laser, there we go. It's also a driver. Yeah, yes, it's a driver in Alzheimer's disease, but it's also a driver in anxiety, depression, and some people would say in the condition like autism as well. It just happens to be a product that uh, grows on the outside of, of many bacteria, a um, particular group of bacteria called gram-negative bacteria. And the, the, the proportion that that may be in someone's ecosystem can, can differ between 20% you know, to 80%. And someone who has 80% obviously has a lot bigger inflammatory load, a lot bigger load of LPS. In their gut. Kidney stones. Who would have ever thought that kidney stone would be links, linked to gut dysbiosis? But indeed it has. There's a particular bacteria that some of you in your gut will have, will have in your gut, sorry, called oxalobacter formagenes. It eats dietary oxalate, which we find in things like spinach for the most part, but also almonds and, a few, and quinoa and a few other foods. But that's all it really eats is, is dietary oxalate. When it's there, it eats the oxalate, you do not absorb it. When it's not there, you absorb it. And when you do absorb it, you're, you have a much greater increased risk of kidney stones. But what I've found fascinating as, as a clinician, because I've been a clinician for, for about 20 years now too, is that there's all, lots of discussion in the blogosphere now about oxalate issues and oxalate that were not discussed 20 years ago. And I think it's because we've done a very good job of eradicating oxalobacter former genes in Western nations in the last 20 years because it's very sensitive to antibiotics. This is one study done in 2011 of people that had it at baseline, 63% of them, it went extinct after treatment for Helicobacter pylori, which is a pretty relatively common microbe that's involved with stomach ulcers. But it illustrates, and I think the commonality uh, of, of giving antibiotic cocktails has increased dramatically. There'll be people who are taking antibiotic cocktails for Lyme disease or for a whole range of other conditions Blastocystis, Dianteva, and many more that we weren't doing this 20, 30 years ago. We are giving them out a lot more now. And I think we're seeing some of the repercussions of, of ecosystem changes. Losses of that single species can have large re repercussions. Obesity. Antibiotics and obesity. And, and this makes sense when you think about the fact that, that in, in our, our food systems, we give pigs and cows, a lot of antibiotics, because it makes them grow quick, quicker. Yes, it helps protect them against infections because they live in unhygienic conditions, but the main reason is because they grow far quicker. The researchers eventually ticked to this and said, well, I wonder if we're giving our kids antibiotics. Does this relate to obesity, the obesity epidemic in some way? And it turns out that the research is pretty consistent around this, that when we give our young kids antibiotics, they're more likely to become, carry more weight into toddlerhood and later on. Now, and there was this brilliant study, which was actually a, a pretty, I'd say, earth-shattering study in, from the microbiome field done in 2006 that showed that the obese microbiome was transmissible. What this means is obesity could be transmitted from someone who had it to someone who did, did not have it by changing, by, by essentially giving them their poo. And they showed this quite clearly in this study where they have a very obese mouse. They get some of its poo. And they gave it to this poor little guy who wasn't obese. <laughs> and that's the outcome. And this was despite no change in calorie input or output. So they were not exercising less, they were not eating more. Calories stayed the same, exercise levels stayed the same. But you know, you get that, that massive change in actual body weight and body fat. So this is pretty groundbreaking because before we were thinking of gut bacteria for gut conditions, this is probably the first time we thought, whoa, it's got actually much bigger impact than we thought. 
the question was, kind of go the other way. And there has been, <laughs> there has been some preliminary positive research around that. So I'd say probably yes. Yeah. This bios is in depression. A recent study, but they did a similar model. But this time they took feces from depressed people. And they gave it in sort of these little tubes to rats. They're like, okay, well, can we transmit depression from these people to these rats? And lo and behold, they could. You know, with a sad little rat. Inability to experience pleasure, and they just started displaying anxiety-like behaviors, but their neurochemistry actually changed. They stopped producing essentially as much tryptophan, uh, sorry, serotonin. Um, they, their, their gut transit time slowed down. And they started becoming, they were more inflamed. This is all from just giving them the poo from a depressed pe person. And, and before you think maybe the rats just didn't like getting people poo, which is a fair consideration, they had a control group that got, got healthy, happy people's poo. They did not get depressed. So it wasn't just getting people's poo. It was actually getting it from depressed people. That was the key factor. And yes, autism. This is one of many studies that have, that have suggested a, a a clear or a difference in ecosystem type between kids with autism versus kids that, that have not. A number of studies have been published over the years. Most have shown, not all, have that there is a difference between kids with autism versus their, their siblings or healthy controls. But studies to date have, what they haven't shown as well is, is the same results per study, which is what we'd like to see, is consistency that runs throughout the 15 different studies all showing the same thing. And they haven't. And I think there's potentially a few reasons for that. One, studies to date have been small. You know, if using 10 people, 15 people, 20 people. Sometimes they're using people from China, sometimes India, sometimes Slovakia. So you, know, you get different dietary patterns, other, other things that they are involved with that too. Sometimes they're comparing it to healthy controls, sometimes to their, their siblings, who are probably on the same diet. So I think there's actually a number of things that mean it's hard to, to give firm conclusions to go that this is a, a autistic picture of, of, of um, dysbiosis that matches all, all people, because I don't think we have that sort of data, but I think it, the data does show that, that in general, kids with autism have a different, different ecosystem than those without. Now, similarly to how we were able to, to transmit obesity, transmit depression, this research group was curious if we can transmit sort of autism type behavior from autistic kids to mice and rats by doing a fecal transplant. Any guesses on the results? Yeah, autistic mice. So yep, they had some so the neurotypical children. They gave them their, their poo to these little germ-free mice in this case, or they gave them kid, poo from kids with autism disorders. And they showed again that they had different sort of social communication skills and it developed repetitive patterns after the transplant. So yes, it does appear that whilst we can't necessarily define what an uh, autistic dysbiotic ecosystem looks like, there, the, we can show that you could actually pass it along from a fecal transplant. And conversely, that the evidence to show that a fecal transplant can actually improve autistic behavior and autistic gut fun function, gut function in autistic kids. This was a 2019 paper, which was a follow-up study from a 2017 study where they essentially had, had kids with, who are on the spectrum and they had gut dysfunction too, which, is, which we know is extremely common. A couple weeks of antibiotics, two weeks, then they gave like a, a colon flush, and then they did essentially eight weeks of fecal microbial transplant, either orally or rectally, didn't seem to make a big difference. Um, the oral one was actually mixing with chocolate milkshakes. <laughs> so some people might argue it makes a difference versus getting a, a, a rectal depository instead. Um, but what was interesting is that, yeah, like the first study they looked at eight weeks later, behavioral things had, had, had significantly improved, gut symptoms had significantly improved. But this was two years afterwards, behaviors were still significantly improved and they actually seemed to get better over time. I mean, gosh, that's incredible that by, by changing that, there's a bunch of flow and effects that are long lasting by changing that gut ecosystem. So we look at some of the diseases, some in more depth than others that are, have now been linked with dysbiosis. Now, how do we get dysbiosis? 
we'll look at that now. And again, I've got a limited time frame, so I can't go into great de as much detail as I'd love to cover everything that's known to cause dysbiosis. We'd be here for probably the whole day. But we know that some agents are particularly good at damaging that ecosystem. And perhaps not surprisingly, the top of the list is antibiotics. But each antibiotic is also different. And e even within that, in terms of how each of you respond, will be a little bit different too, because it will each carry our own sort of antibiotic resistances to, to whatever we're gonna be exposed to. It's a complicated a wee bit. Now, early research um, using culturing techniques, and we're gonna cover what that means later on this afternoon, suggested that quantitative changes may only, may only look different for around 40 days afterwards. And we did a, a systematic review um, in the early 2000s. We grabbed every single study that looked at antibiotics and the impact on the gut microbiota, brought it all together. And I was surprised at how little the impact seemed to be of antibiotics at that, based on the data we had at that time point using the technology we had. Was that okay? Two, three, four weeks afterwards, it seemed to look back, back to normal again, um, which was a bit surprising. But there was a study published, the, the Kilkenny study in 2002 suggested that maybe it looks normal, but for even almost a year and a half after a course of antibiotics, your, its functionality was different. Its ability to, to essentially break down those polyphenols that are those health promoting anti cancer compounds into something we can absorb is different for almost a year and a half after a course of antibiotics. And that gave hints that the technology we were using was too poor to actually see the changes that were really there. And that turns out to be the case. And that when we started using molecular techniques from in 2005 onwards, we started seeing that, that even a single course of antibiotics could cause dramatic shifts. Quindamycin, you know, 18 to 24 months after a single course, the ecosystem was still not the same. Mostly there, but not so not quite the same. Helicobacter, where you take that sort of two antibiotics and a proton pump inhibitor, four years. The ecosystem did not look the same. So it's important to note that some organisms never recover, and we're talking about localized extinction, essentially. Two thousand fifteen paper. And I think I'll just read out the, the, the key thing about the quote, but the fecal microbiome was severely affected by most antibiotics for months. Health associated butate producing species became strongly under, underrepresented. Clearly, even a single antibiotic treatment leads to long lasting detrimental shifts in the gut ecosystem. Single course. How many of, our, of us and our kids are exposed to one, two, three, four, five, six? sometimes more courses per year. We wonder why we've got a dysbiotic state of the population. In fact, I remember having one patient come to see me, three-year-old, 30 courses of antibiotics by the time they were three. Yeah. It's not uncommon, no, it's true. Um, this is a, was a great paper published in my, my all-time favorite journal, Gut. Great name. Um, what, so this published last year, and it's a pretty cool study because they just were following a single person over time with sort of almost like daily fecal analysis to see what, what shifted and what, what stayed the same. And it was cruising along, not shifting at all because their diet lifestyle was the same. So there's no real shifts until they gave a course of antibiotics by IV administration. It wasn't taken orally, it was given by IV. And all of a sudden, this little species called Bork Falkai it went from 0.08% of that ecosystem up to 92% of what's there. And you might be curious how it got such a weird name. Look at the authors of the paper, Bork, Falk. They just named it after themselves. In fact, we didn't even know that, be, that species existed up until they did this research paper and it wasn't named until they actually did it. Thousand fold increase. Why did that happen? Because this microbe was resistant to that antibiotic, whereas the others weren't, had tremendous space to grow into. But what's really important to me, nine species went extinct. Nine species from that single course of antibiotics. Okay. So I like to tell my patients that, that normal gut ecosystem is like a, a tropical rainforest where every single niche is fueled with life. Lots of different species living together, lovely harmony, balance, 
And that's sort of after an underwater cocktail, particularly, where there's not much surviving species. They, 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 so it comes back, certain species that were there at 40, 50% of the ecosystem before, 20%, they will come back. But the ones that were there at low amounts before, generally often sometimes will not, like that person that lost nine species from that single course of antibiotics. Do we know the repercussions of that? No, because some of those nine species, we don't even know what they are. We don't know what role that they play. We don't know yet what that repercussion is. But we know that antibiotics have a number of, of impacts that's, that can lead to increased susceptibility to infections, essentially by changing you know, um, the ecosystem, which results in decreased immune system function. Um, not surprisingly, we start getting a lot more antibiotic resistant genes piling up in the gut with the more antibiotics we take. We start changing how the immune system functions more broadly. We get inf elevated inflammatory tone, a change in Treg TH balance, which, which can result in things like autoimmune diseases. And then we get this dysregulated metabolism where we get increased again inflammatory load and, and worsened insulin sensitivity, at least to things like metabolic syndrome and, and type 2 diabetes, which again are very common. Other medications we need to be aware of are proton pump inhibitors. Now, you may or may not know, know what that is, but it's the most common use, or one of the most commonly used classes of medications in North America and Australia. It's used to treat reflux, heartburn. It's available over the counter, even. But what you may not know is that PPIs actually have antibiotic-like effects in the gut. One of the reasons they were, they were originally used to treat Helicobacter pylori is because it kills it. It turns out it kills a range of bacteria in our gut, not just that. And unlike most antibiotics that we just take for a week or two weeks, this short-term high, we're, we're often taking this for months to years when people take them, sometimes multiple years. But, and no one really knew about the impact on the gut ecosystem until 2014 onwards, when C2 did their research, and they found that within seven days, the ecosystem starts changing. And there's a marked loss of diversity, and it only was partly reversed afterwards. Because again, once the species is extinct, it's gone, it is gone. Increased risk of SIBO, increased risk of Clostridioides difficile infection. And I just flagged Clostridioides because it's just recently had a name change from Clostridium difficile. Decreased levels of sort of beneficial bacteria like Bifidobacter in the gut. And again, 2016 study also showed lower microbial diversity, but they seem to have a selective activity that encourages the growth of bacteria that we don't want while, while getting rid of the, the beneficial bacteria we do want. So that's not a good balanced ecosystem. And we also know that people that take proton pump inhibitors have increased risk of things like Alzheimer's disease. That's come out very recently with research. And that sort of ecosystem where you get lower levels of beneficial bacteria, lower levels of diversity, <laughs> higher levels of proteobacteria, you would see as being a risk factor for Alzheimer's development. Because proteobacteria have a hell of a lot of lipopolysaccharide or LPS, which is that agent that has the capacity to, of damaging the blood-brain barrier. non steroidal anti-inflammatory things like ibuprofen, for example, that most of us think of as causing gut damage. They do do that, but they also cause shifts in the ecosystems. Increased levels of endotoxins and increased levels of secondary bile acids, which cause gut damage. And sadly, lower levels of bifidobacteria and lactobacilli. Moving on to some foods. Artificial sweeteners, which are becoming more and more commonplace, sadly. What impact do they have on the gut? Started to be looked at. And we can see they had almost an antibacterial-like effect on the gut ecosystem. This was looking at sucralose specifically, lower numbers of total anaerobes and aerobes, and specifically those beneficial groups of bacteria there, and increased fecal pH, which essentially means it, it, by decreasing levels of, of benef beneficial fermented bacteria, results in a sort of an alkalizing effect in the gut, which is not a good thing. Saccharin, increased levels of what we call pathobionts, species that, that are, cause harm in the wrong amount, and decreased levels of beneficial bacteria like lactobacilli and acomansia. And interestingly enough, it actually caused glucose intolerance. So these people that are they're eating this thinking that it's going to help with their, their blood sugar control, it actually worsens blood sugar control, but it does it in a different way by altering the ecosystem in the gut. Dietary emulsifiers, which sadly are very commonplace in our processed food society, 
read labels, you'll find that how common these compounds are, but carboxymethylcellulose, polysorbate 80, they're good at making food textures um, more, more palatable for us Westerners. They're good at mixing like oil and water together so it can stick in some goop. But hence why we tend to see it widely used in ice creams. Impact of these agents, they decrease overall diversity of, the, of that ecosystem. And again, increased levels of pro-inflammatory groups of bacteria like proteobacteria. Cause low-grade gut inflammation and contribute to metabolic dysfunction. And it is, it's not like the ice cream you make at home that uses cream and sugar and fruit, that doesn't contain it. But the stuff you buy from Safeway or Sobeys, like you know, $2 for this huge tub of ice cream, has a lot of those things because it actually allows them to use vegetable oil and water and sugar and combine it to make ice cream. So we'll have to probably hold questions to the end, but I'm quite happy to get there. Environmental chemicals, again, I'm moving to them relatively quickly to get, try to give a spread of, of what we need to be aware of, but there's a lot of environmental chemicals and we don't have a chance to go through all of them. But I did want to flag these ones because they're relatively common in cleaning products and in toothpaste. Diethyl phthalate, methylparaben, and triclosan. This was a rat study, but it showed that, that you know, they were using like, like amounts that, that humans could be exposed to if they're using the home, um, caused shifts in that ecosystem, again, an increase in that proteobacteria population, which is that sort of pro inflammatory group of bacteria. And importantly, it actually had a bigger impact on adolescents. Kids' ecosystems are far more fragile, less stable more easily influenced and damaged. That's a good takeaway. Now, triclosan, which is a potent antimicrobial compound, is rife through toothpaste. And in that dose that you get in the toothpaste that you swallow is enough to change the gut ecosystem. And it's not necessarily on the label of that toothpaste, but pretty much every single commercial toothpaste will contain triclosan. I'll touch on Roundup just because it's, it's so commonly out there. Um, glyphosate, another rat study where they gave it from essentially during gestation to, to you know, 125 days post, postnatally, um, and it did change the ecosystem, but primarily in the next generation, not necessarily the moms, which I thought was fascinating. And the biggest impact, again, was in, in the younger Eight, like pre-pubertal age as well. But other persistent organic pollutants, other plasticizers have all been linked to changes in gut ecosystem as well. So this is just a small snippet um, of chemicals that we're exposed to that cause harm. And diet. Even excluding those dietary additives, et cetera, that we're exposed to, are we eating diets that actually cause a disbody ecosystem? Some of us are, definitely. And some of the ones on this list will be perhaps surprising because they're quite commonly discussed on the blogosphere, but like high protein, low carb, for example. We know this is a study done in humans 2007. They found a 50% decrease in bifidobacteria populations within just four weeks. And bifidobacteria is really one of those clear beneficial groups of bacteria that we don't want to decrease by 50%. Also decreased butyrate producing species like Roseborea and Eubacterium. And we talked about, like Dr. Farr was talking about the importance of butyrate. It's an amazing substance. What we feed or don't feed our ecosystem determines whether we produce and how much butyrate we produce. Most of the compounds that, that feed our butyrate producing bacteria are in plant fibers and starches. You cut out plant fibers and starches, particularly resistant starches, oligosaccharides, your butyrate production goes down. Your level of butyrate producing bacteria goes down, which is what we saw in this study. Ketogenic diet, also very popular on the blogosphere these days. Increased populations of the sulfur vibrio, which is a hydrogen sulfide gas producing species, it's a pro-inflammatory species. Now, this one sort of eats animal protein, so it wasn't surprising that its population goes up. Sometimes we get fixed that bacteria only eat sugar. That's completely wrong. Certain bacteria eat protein, certain bacteria eat bile, certain bacteria eat a range of different fibers, and some eat sugars too. But I think sometimes people get the idea that sugar is the only thing that, that feeds bad bacteria in your gut. No, <laughs> it's completely wrong. Uh, Low-carb, high-fat diet. 
Again, significant reductions in bifidobacteria populations, decreased butyrate concentrations as well. So that's, again, a human study. But I did want to flag that both these meals are keto, but they're quite different as well. So I do think there's a capacity of doing um, a ketogenic diet if it's well indicated for a specific condition for a short period of time, that you can do it with, with one that's far more based on plant food, but you need to make sure you're supplementing with additional prebiotics and additional fibers like psyllium and, and probably more um, to try to offset some of the damage that you'd otherwise would get with such a diet. And I don't tend to recommend ketogenic diets, but I do know from research there are specific times and windows which they might have a uh, application for, but I think we need to be cautious around them. And sadly, and lastly, our diet, standard Western diet of things like, what are they called? Um, SpaghettiOs. We call it from when I was a kid. Um, now, the standard Western diet we know is low in polyphenols. It's low in dietary fiber in total, but low in fiber diversity. We don't eat much. Of, of different sorts of plant food, we tend to be stuck with just eating you know, wheat bread, maybe a banana and an apple, not much diversity. Standard Western diet, high in processed foods, high in food additives, high in food chemicals, and it's low in what we would call microbiotic accessible carbohydrates and low in polyphenols. And this is important because this is what feeds the good guys in your gut. If you don't eat these things, you do not feed the good guys in your gut. And this is one of the main problems with the standard Western diet, is we don't eat much of those things. And I love this quote. The Sonnenbergs are a microbiota research team in um, California. The Western diet starves your microbial self. That has a few different concepts in there. But as I said, was saying before, is that your microbes are immensely important for making you who you are. And if you don't feed them, not, those cells aren't being nurtured and nourished, and there are repercussions. Now, I also want to flag some natural medicines that are also capable of inducing dysbiosis, too. We certainly talked about pharmaceuticals, et cetera. But I think we also need to flag certain, and, and I put natural medicine in quotation mark for something called citrus seed extract. Have many of you heard of citrus seed or grapefruit seed extract? Yeah. Um, it's not natural, despite the name. It, it's actually spiked with benzodium chloride, triclosan, and, and methylparaben which is why it works as an antimicrobial. If you take those antiseptics out of it, it does not work as an antimicrobial. So chewing on citrus seeds, not a problem. Taking a grapefruit seed extract is a problem because it's got these antiseptic compounds in it. And it seems like it's deliberately spiked because they seem to be changing the ones that they find in there now into different chlorinated compounds. So not good. Um, when I did some Research in my, as part of my PhD, looking at the impact of, of herbal supplements on, on the gut microbiota, it was, it was in vitro test tube research, but citrus seed extract was worse than the worst antibiotic, which is clindamycin, in terms of the breadth of bacteria that it killed. It was better at killing the beneficial guys than it was pathogens. And so not recommended, but it, it's, it's not natural. And I think that's the key thing I really want to get across, that if you're going to be taking a synthetic antimicrobial, take antibiotics that have at least been human clinical trial, and you know what the impact is don't take these sort of hospital-grade disinfectants that are used for topical purposes internally. Um, many of you heard of berberine? No. Well, it's an alkaloid found in certain herbs. And it's isolated out because it works as an antimicrobial. It has impacts on, on blood sugar regulation as well, but often it's used as an antimicrobial. Um, it, my research suggested it was not particularly selective. It was good at killing bifidobacteria, which is not a good thing. And my clinical experience with doing, working with patients and stool testing suggests the same. It seems to decrease overall diversity of the ecosystem with continued use and targets bifidobacteria, which is, again, not a good thing. Enteric coated essential oils. You know, essential oils, we have to remember that they're very potent, concentrated plant extracts that are might be giant fields of oregano or oregano that go into making like one little drop. Super concentrated. And yes, it, it does kill things very well, but it also can kill your beneficial bacteria too. So we need to be cautious around that. Personally, I, I prefer using herbal tinctures of things like oregano or clove, thyme, similar herbs, but in a less potent, less concentrated form. Um, and I think we need to be very cautious around these biofilm dusting products too, um, for a few reasons. One of which is that most of these formulations have got no tradition of use and don't have human studies showing the impact on the gut. 
You know, they're designed to break down bacterial biofilm. But what does that mean in the gut? Yeah, it does it in test tubes on pathogens, but do they test it against beneficial bacteria? No. And the thing is, is that it's not like just bad guys live in biofilm. All the bacteria in your gut live in biofilm, including all your beneficial ones. So if you're breaking down biofilm, this is, which is the sort of protective coating around beneficial bacteria, is that going to have a good outcome? All right, so we've covered a fair bit of material that's looked at, at causations of, of dysbiotic ecosystem. And I love this, this concept from Martin Blazer from New York. He's brought up this idea of the disappearing microbiota hypothesis. Humans and our ancestors have evolved since those ancient times with a symbiotic microbiota. But through modern medical practices, lifestyle, dietary changes, this ecosystem is changing sometimes to an extreme degree. You know, we're now drinking you know, chlorinated drinking water for the first time, chlorinated bathing water, which means we don't get exposure to microbes in the way that we used to. And there's, there's pros with that too. Obviously, if somebody uh, the upstream in your creek had salmonella, they pooed it and you drank it, well, we'd get some now. But if that person had a beautiful, healthy ecosystem and you were exposed to their bugs, it was a way of, of replenishing your, your stock that you may have otherwise lost. You know, we know kids born by a C-section are, are, have a different ecosystem sort of passed on to them. High rates of preterm and infant antibiotic use, it can have big impacts on that ecosystem. Uh, because as I mentioned before, uh, the smaller, the younger you are, the more fragile and, and, and easily shaped your ecosystem is. So there's a lot of species that are at teeny tiny amounts in infants. And all it takes is a course of antibiotics to really wipe out a, a decent number of species that are then gone from that ecosystem. You know, widespread antibiotic use throughout life, reduce breastfeeding rates. So we tend to often as Westerners think of, of breast milk as a, as a food. And yeah, it is a food for infants, but it also contains 100 plus species of beneficial bacteria that the mom is passing on to the next generation. It contains special um, prebiotic sugars called community milk oligosaccharides that are almost specific to the family line to help encourage that mom's bacteria that grow in the next generation. And we take that out of the mix. We can't possibly have, a, have such a diverse ecosystem anymore. And we're using tons of those antibacterial soaps and sprays and creams, particularly because we've got kids. We're like, we want to make sure it's clean. No. And they argue that the disappearance of ancestral indigenous organisms is not beneficial and has consequences. And we're living with those consequences and we're seeing those consequences now. Another um, image from, from Martin Blazer and team and what I liked about this image it kind of shows what's going on. So the previous generations back before antibiotics, before sort of the sort of Western diet, et cetera, and when, when essentially birth was a much more normal process of, of vaginal birth, breastfeeding is like that. The vertical transmission of mum to the next generation happened very cleanly. All, we all had this replete ancestral microbiota that the mum passed the next generation. We were living in conditions where close proximity to other family members, you know, less hygienic, so there was, there was a lot of chance of, of mixing microbes. You might be in the bath playing with other kids or the creek playing with other creek kids, and there's a way of changing microbes around. Um, makes you think of a study that was just done in Japan. In the Japanese hot tubs, they're able to actually pass bacteria between each other, like bifidobacteria, whereas us in our chlorinated hot tubs cannot. And, and we had this, this evolution with these microbes so that when the right blend of microbes is there, our immune system is trained to function properly. You skip forward a few generations in time, is we have a depleted microbiota that gets passed on from generation to generation. And you can only pass on what you've got. And you know, the previous generations maybe had a spread of this many, maybe we're here now, but that's all we can pass on to the next generation. And every course of antibiotics they take, all the Western dietary protocol, antibacterial products, it gets diminished. And that's what they can pass on to the next generation. But we can see that that lack of, and, and we also have little chance of regaining microbes back from, because they don't get that contact with fecal material from other people, like we used to in previous generations. So there's no way of, of repleting that microbiota. It's altered how our immune system functions, which is why we're getting peanut allergies, fish, fish allergies, why we're getting autoimmune diseases that are going through the roof. Um, the Sonnenbergs put it a little bit differently. They call it the microbiota insufficiency syndrome. And they've 
I like what they call it the, the vanished taxes, what, what we in Western countries don't have anymore. And what's interesting with some of these bugs, like, like within the, the Spirocataceae and the Succinovibrinaceae, we don't actually know what they do. We don't know what their role are, but we don't have them. And our ancestors did, traditional cultures did. And they might make up 30% of, of that person, that, of that generation, that sort of class ecosystem, whereas us, they make up less than 3%. And they would argue we're seeing the repercussions of that now. So the disappearing microbiota has consequences. Diabetes, Alzheimer's, depression, anxiety, rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera. And what we'll talk about this afternoon is, is, is tests to assess the health of that ecosystem and what tools we can use to try to bring it back into balance. And that's really it for me. Um, and I think we'll probably save questions for later on. Yep, cool, thank you.